Welcome to Big Data Spain 2018. How about a hand for that? All right. Advancing human exploration. What does that mean? In my introduction, I talked about we are, we are all explorers. We're exploring the human experience in our daily lives. The people we meet, the people we talk to, the friends we've had, the jobs we've had, the pets we've had, everything that we've had. We're all enjoying, we're all exploring the human experience. How can we improve or advance the human experience? That's what we're here for today at this conference. The people in this room are leaders in both big data and artificial intelligence. And hopefully, by advancing these two techniques, we'll be advancing human exploration, exploration of the human experience. That's what I'm going to talk about today. We are all explorers. We use big data for a whole variety of different techniques. We may be literally exploring for energy or natural resources. We may be mining data for marketing skills, marketing data, hopefully make some money along the way, which is uh, you know, part of the reason that we're all here, as well as advancing medicine, for instance, curing cancer for little kids, curing uh, Alzheimer's and uh, geriatric uh, diseases for, for the elderly. Uh, I'm interested in space exploration. <clears throat> Here's a picture of two astronauts on an EVA at the uh, space station. I dedicated most of my professional career to the exploration of space, and so I'm going to talk about a little bit about how big data and artificial intelligence has helped advance exploration for the exploration of space. Big data in aerospace. Everyone's probably quite familiar. There's a variety of different applications in aerospace, uh, everywhere from cosmologies, looking for exoplanets, possibly that we could go to it someday if we could figure out how to travel faster than life. We use big data analytics to collect all the data from the, from the Goldstone Observatory, the other observatories around the world that all feed the deep space network. All that big data comes in and gets processed and analyzed. We used artificial intelligence to look for these exoplanets to identify which ones are the candidates that are, that are most suitable or most uh, uh, interesting from our perspective, possibly as, as second planets that we would like to go to and visit someday, possibly even cat, uh, Um We also have big data in all the different Earth-observing satellites. This is just a small picture of just a handful of the satellites that we have primarily in the United States, with a lot of international par partners also involved. But we get a huge amount of data coming down, looking at the earth, looking at the weather, looking at the land, everything that's going on, from farming to natural resources to weather and climate. It's all being collected at a huge rate that all uses big data analytics to process and analyze that. The video on the lower right-hand corner is showing, actually showing air pollution as it propagates around the planet. Uh, pollution in China or in the United States or in Europe moves around. We're all living on one big blue marble, so everybody affects everybody else. And so it's important to really understand and be able to quantify these effects. In the upper right-hand corner is something more along the line of what I do. I'm technically an aerodynamicist, so I'm interested in high-speed vehicles re-entering the flow, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, for instance, and the flow field around that. That's an example of a capsule coming into uh, into the Earth's atmosphere at a very high Mach number. AI in aerospace. Upper right-hand corner is the International Space Station, $110 billion project, uh, a lot of international uh, partners. We have NASA for the United States, we have ESA, we have the Russians, the, the Japanese, and a host of other nations all working together to advance humankind, to get human exploration out off of the planet into deep space eventually. In the upper right-hand co right corner, this is a CFD computation, a computational fluid dynamics result of the flow field around a drone. It's a simple four-propeller drone flying, and this is actually showing some of the turbulence that's coming, off of the, uh, that's coming off of those propellers. We use artificial intelligence to understand the, the fluid mechanics and to improve our turbulence models so we can come up with better estimates on exactly how a given drone is going to perform. 
In the lower right-hand corner is something that's very important to all of us. It's basically temperature anomalies over the last uh, 10 years re related to global warming. A lot of people in the United States aren't really sure global warming is true. I look at data and can't understand how could they reach that conclusion. It's here, it's a reality. We may not like it, but we're going to have to deal with it. And the first part of having to deal with it is understanding exactly what it is. And so we're using artificial, artificial intelligence to understand the data and help extract as much information as we can to really understand what is the Earth doing. All the interplay between the carbon dioxide and the atmosphere, between the sun and the earth, between the oceans and the atmosphere, these are all very important, and we have to understand all of them to really understand and fix, potentially, the problem in the long term. Also, I have a D-Wave quantum computer. Quantum computers are the next best thing. They're really great. I used to work on one when I was at Lockheed Martin, but the biggest problem is trying to fuse the problem that you're trying to solve into the type of problem the quantum computer can solve very, very quickly. That's not really a done deal. That's not really been accomplished for every possible scenario. So we need help in that area also. We're approaching the 50th anniversary of the Apollo lunar landing. July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. First time humans walked uh, walked on a uh, heavenly body other than the Earth. 50-year anniversary is coming up next, next summer. There's going to be a lot of activities, both in the United States and around the world, to celebrate that event. The problem is the astronauts that walked on, that, uh, walked on those missions, not just Apollo 11, but all the Apollo program missions, there were 12 people that work, walked on the moon. They were in their mid to, uh, mid, early to mid-30s at the time, and now they're in their early to mid-80s. A couple of them have passed away, and I wonder, I wonder myself, is the human species going to have this memory of walking on the moon, or is it going to take us so long to get back to the moon that all the original astronauts will be gone? I really push, let's go back to the moon, let's go to the moon, let's explore, there's a lot of reasons to go. There's plenty of iron, there's plenty of aluminum. If there's water at the North and South Pole, we can make rocket fuel. It's a great staging area to go into deep space. So I think returning to the moon is very, very important for human exploration into the deep space. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've done personally and talk about the Orion Space Launch System. This is NASA's vision for going into deep space. Uh, we're using the same kind of nomenclature they used in the Apollo Saturn V era, where the Apollo is the spacecraft or the payload, and the Saturn V is the launch vehicle. In this scenario, we have the Orion spacecraft is the spacecraft where the people will be living, as well as the uh, space launch system, which is the launch vehicle that'll take it. The space launch uh, vehicle shown here and shown in animation uh, has four SSME, Space Shuttle Main Engines, on the center core. These are liquid-fueled hydrogen-oxygen engines that will begin uh, burning from liftoff. Outside of that, you have two extended shuttle-type solid rocket boosters that will boost the vehicle off the pad and get it up to flight. Again, as during the shuttle launches, after about two minutes or so, those solid rocket boosters will extinguish themselves or burn up all their fuel, and they'll drop away, and the center core will go on further. After the first stage separates, the SRB separate, the center core fires for about another five or six minutes, and then it stages, and there are hydrogen-oxygen upper stage engines that propel it further, either into orbit or into a, like a translunar or a trans-Martian injection, an orbital path that'll take us to either the moon or to Mars. There's an, an animation of it flying. Hopefully we'll get a test flight, probably not in 2019, but hopefully 2020 is the latest estimate. Uh, it's one of these things where you have two big programs and they're both kind of fighting each other. Who's going who's to play chicken and have to delay the schedule? But we're hoping for 2020 for the first flight of the Orion SLS vehicle. Specifically, I worked on the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle, which is the part where the astronauts lived in. Uh, it's very much like the Apollo era. We have a center module that's sort of half heat shield and half cone, known as the crew module, and that's where the crew will be living. 
Uh, this vehicle is much larger than the Apollo era vehicle, and I've got a slide for that in a couple of, uh, a couple of slides. But it's basically, you've got a conical shape, you've got a heat shield, and so it's designed to handle the higher re-entry temperatures of coming back for the moon, and then with subsequent upgrades, we'll be able to come back from Mars with this vehicle. Originally, it was designed to handle uh, six astronauts. We could go up to like the space station if we had to and bring up six at a time. For the lunar and Martian missions, it's really designed for four astronauts, but it's a very small space. It's something like an American minivan kind of volume, which is pretty small. So when we do go to those deep space missions, we'll have additional assets with us, additional pieces and components of spacecraft to give us a little bit more breathing room for experiments, for the astronauts, et cetera, et cetera. They won't have to live in this minivan for, for the whole long time. Uh, at the top of the uh, uh, Orion vehicle is the launch abort system. The shuttle did not have a, an, a, an effective way to get the crew out of trouble, and they had a problem with the, uh, with the uh, Columbia, I'm sorry, the Challenger accident, where they did not have an ability to get the crew out of danger. NASA wanted to go back and put that abort capability in. So it's very similar to what they had on the Apollo era, known as the launch abort system. We call ours the, the, the launch escape system. I'm sorry, on the Ryan, we call it the launch abort system. It has a very powerful solid rocket motor, and when, they, when things go bad and they hit that big red button to abort the crew, the crew pulls something like 12 Gs to get away from the exploding rocket and can very safely get them about a quarter of a mile away from the exploding rocket and to, safely, to safety. From there, they execute a variety of different maneuvers and then drop off the crew module with parachutes and everything and land just like it would normally. Behind the crew module is the service module. There's a couple of different designs. ESA, the European Space Agency, is building our first two uh, service modules. Uh, parts are being assembled. Parts have already arrived in the United States. So we're very excited to working with the, with the European Space Agency. Again, we come down to the classic problem of English units, which the Americans like, and SI units that the rest of the world like. I apologize, I didn't set it up, but that's the way it is. We still have that problem. Uh, the service module has tanks for hydrogen, oxygen, other types of systems. Uh, it has engines that can maneuver us around within, the, uh, uh, within our orbital plane, so if we want to go uh, up in orbit or down in orbit. Also, maneuvering engines so we could change our attitude if we're going to do docking to the space station or to some other module. Uh, it has all these different types of equipment. Here's a comparison between the Apollo spacecraft shown on the right, I'm sorry, shown on the left, and the Orion spacecraft shown on the right. Uh, these are both done to scale. It's a little difficult to see, but the Orion spacecraft is about 40% larger in linear scale. Uh, it's a very similar geometry, just scaled up. Well, if you scale up, you know, 1.4 to the cube power, it's a lot more volume, so it's a lot bigger than you realize. If anybody's gone and never seen one of the Apollo spacecraft at a museum or something, man, those are really tiny vehicles, and you barely had room for the three astronauts to wiggle around in. Orion is, by comparison, much more spacious. This will be a much more comfortable ride for them. There'll be a lot more room to bring equipment and experiments, plus supplies like food and, and uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen and things. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got the ESA service module that we're looking forward to, and everything ad adapts to the spacecraft with what they call in a spacecraft adapter section. It's just a simple conical section that carries the loads from our launch vehicle down to uh, the spacecraft itself. I always like this comparison. People ask me, what's the difference between Orion and Apollo? And I always look back and think of, well, I'm a bit of a car guy also. What kind of cars were available when they were designing uh, the Apollo spacecraft? So on the left is a 1964 Chevrolet Corvair, common small car made by, Chevrolet, by General Motors at the time. On the right is a uh, 2015 Tesla Model S, fully electric car. The Corvair generated something on the order of 60 horsepower, uh, zero to 60 miles an hour was on the order of 18 seconds. Uh, the top speed was just under 80 miles an hour. It uh, got terrible gas mileage, and Ralph Nader wrote a book saying it was unsafe at any speed. And so this is the technology in the automobile industry that was going on 
when the Apollo spacecraft was designed in the mid-60s. You look at the Apollo console, a lot of switches, not very many automated systems whatsoever. They had tons and tons of checklists. Everything was done very, very manually, and they had to keep track of everything and monitor everything manually. Very, very labor-intensive. By comparison, a Tesla Model S, depending upon the, uh, the version you get, has something on the order of 580 horsepower. Zero to 60 is three seconds or faster. Top speed of a Model S, I think, is on the order of about 180 miles an hour, which is, uh, you know, pretty fast. Uh, it has self-driving modes, and so a lot of the times it could drive itself automatically, self-parking, self-retrieval from a parking spot, a lot of automated systems, let alone to talk about the, how much better the speaker system is and the, and the Wi-Fi access. And so you could see in that environment with the Tesla S technology, those are the kinds of technologies that we have on Orion. We basically have three big flat panel displays on Orion. Everything is done that way. Everything is done with touch screen. It's awesome. It's fabulous. A lot of the systems are all automated. We use a lot of artificial intelligence in the health monitoring of, this, of the spacecraft, making sure that it's doing OK, it's doing its thing properly. I, I pulled out this one particular slide. And we're picking on the guidance navigation and control computer because at the time that was the biggest computer, the fastest computer, you know, the best hardware on the Apollo spacecraft. And I compare it to what we've got on Orion. And so look at the uh, megabytes of the ROM for the flight controller com computer, 0 0.07 megabytes. Uh, you know, this, this flipper probably has more memory than that. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, even now, the Orion only has 64 megabytes, which is very, very small. You can look at the dimensions, they're so much different. The power uses are, are different. Back on Apollo, they even had sextants in scanning telescopes so they could actually go to manual navigation if they needed to. We decided we don't even need that. We've got inertia systems that keeps track of where we are. We got the global positioning system now, and we're using AI to be able to extend the GPS system out into deep space and be able to do very accurate maneuvers, even if we're going to the moon or even on our way to Mars and back. So we don't need these manual systems, so they're not included. But it's always amazing how much technology's changed just in those 50 years since man first walked on the moon. We have done a flight test of the Orion vehicle. It was called Exploration Flight Test Number 1 back in December of 2014. Since the space launch system wasn't available at the time, we had to use a different launch vehicle. We used a Delta, uh, a Delta IV Heavy, which is from the United Launch Alliance uh, suite of vehicles. Here's a picture of it going up on the uh, upper left. It was a very simple flight. It was basically two orbits. We did one quick orbit close to the planet just to make sure everything was working out okay. And then we stayed attached to the upper stage and burned the upper stage to do a big kind of looping orbit so that we could come in at a higher velocity, a higher velocity than what you would have coming back from low Earth orbit, for instance, coming back from the space station. Now, we didn't reach the velocities that we wanted to coming back from the moon, for instance, but it was much higher than it would be coming back from Earth orbit. With velocities comes heating. And so while something like SpaceX Dragon can use basically modified space shuttle tiles on its heat shield and survive reentry, Orion isn't able to do that. The heating goes up something like the velocity cubed. And so you could see when you go from a low Earth orbit to a lunar return type of velocity, the heating is much, much greater. So we have to use a different type of material. The material that we're using is called Avcoat on the heat shield. It's an ablative material. What that means is when it gets sufficiently hot, it actually changes phase and kind of sublines and, and leaves the vehicle, it takes a lot of the heat with it, and so it keeps the, the spacecraft itself very, very, uh, very, very cool. Interesting story, we lost the recipe for Avcoat. We lost the recipe on how the Apollo spacecraft heat shield was actually made. They literally went to the Museum of Science and, and um, the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., drilled core samples through the heat shield and then did chemical analysis to figure out what was in it. It was some pretty nasty stuff, and so when we reinvented it, we had to do some a little bit more EPA-friendly uh, technologies and everything. But I love that story because it always reminds me of concrete in the Roman Empire. You know, the Romans had concrete, they had different types of concrete. They had concretes that would even dry underwater. It was fabulous stuff. 
And then with the decline of the Roman Empire and the Dark Ages, people forgot how to make concrete. The formula literally disappeared until the 1700s when chemists kind of finally figured out the missing ingredient, which was ash from a fire. You add that to the mixture and you got decent Roman concrete. And so forgetting how to make AFCOAT was kind of like the Roman Empire forgetting how to make uh, I'm sorry, the forgetting how to make AFCOAT was like the Roman Empire forgetting how to make concrete. So I guess the lesson is, uh, if it's not written down, it never happened. So be sure to document everything. When we came into our atmosphere, we were coming in at 20,000 miles an hour, had 4,000 degrees on our, on our vehicle. And here's a picture of our vehicle splashing down in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Pacific Ocean right off of Baja, California. It was a great flight. Everything worked really well. We did not have any people on board, uh, but we did have an ECLIS system, an environmental control system, and the Gs were such, and the environment was such in terms of oxygen and humidity and everything, that if you wanted to actually go for the ride, you would have been fine. We had a lot of cameras, took a lot of great pictures. There were these huge big boxes with like 10,000 little pins because, you know, NASA's a very political organization. Everybody's got to get their little pin to say it was in space. So they had, these big, they had these big boxes of pins in there. That was pretty funny. Here's another uh, view of our, here's a view of our next mission called Exploration Number One. This time we're going to leave Earth orbit and go out to the moon and go into what they call a distant retrograde orbit, which means it's going to take us two or three days to get out to the moon. We're going to do this big halo orbit around the moon for a better part of a month and then come back in. This first mission will be unmanned. Uh, once again, it's planned for about 2020. The second mission, the next mission, called Exploration Mission Number 2, will be a very similar type of mission. It'll be about a month in duration, but this one will be manned. We'll have people on board. They could evaluate the systems. They could try different things and just see what living on board uh, the minivan size volume for four astronauts is like for a month. Doesn't really sound like that great of a, of a time, but, you know. Let's talk about big data and the Orion spacecraft specifically. Uh, there are over 350,000 measurands, in other words, thermocouples, heat transfer gauges, pressure measurements, all sorts of different measurements being taken. These are generally taken at, uh, tw at uh, 40 times per second. Uh, we're capturing roughly two terabytes of data each hour and have about 1,000 times faster transfer speeds than we have on the space station, which is no slouch in itself. Uh, there are over 1,200 uh, telemeter sensors that go straight back down to the Earth all the time in real time. While this doesn't sound like a huge amount of data, in aerospace, the biggest problem or the biggest uh, constraint for big data is the speed. We have to be able to acquire the data quickly and then decide, is the rocket blowing up? Do we need to get the uh, astronauts out of there? Do we need to abort the mission? We need to make these decisions in you know, tenths of a second, you know, 100 milliseconds, something like that, very, very quickly. And so while the data requirements in terms of bits isn't very large, the time frame of when we have to analyze and make a, make a result and decide what to do is very, very short. And that's what makes it unique for aerospace. Future exploration missions after those, uh, uh, the two that I talked about going to the moon, uh, we talked about working with telerobotics in the lower left-hand corner, uh, use uh, the Orion spacecraft as a relay station to work with rovers on the dark side of the moon and the far side of the moon uh, that we cannot communicate with directly to Earth. We could also build a space station-like vehicle around the lunar, uh, in lunar orbit, and we could go there and then possibly go from that down to the, uh, to the surface and explore the surface. We could also rendezvous with an asteroid, which is one of the leading candidate missions that NASA is looking, like, looking at. Go to an asteroid, explore, c collect some rocks, you know, chip at it, whatever, and then come back home. But the real reason we're doing this is we want to go to Mars. Now, everybody has a big opinion about whether we should go to the moon first or whether we should go to Mars. Personally, I think we should go to the moon first it's only three days away. If there's a problem, we could bring them home quickly. There's plenty of things to do at, at the moon. There's a lot of exploration going on. I talked about the mineral wealth. I talked about the hydrogen and oxygen that could be available in the ice. So let's go back to the moon and get our systems working. Eventually, yes, we should go to Mars when we're ready to go. Why do we want to go to Mars? Well, it's about half the size of the Earth. 
A Mars day is almost the same as an Earth day. Mars year is a little bit longer. It's farther from the sun, so it's going to have a, a longer orbit. Uh, the mass is quite a bit less, and so the gravity on the surface is only 38% of what it is on the surface of the Earth. The atmosphere is a lot of carbon dioxide, can't really breathe that, uh, but who knows, someday we may be terraforming Mars, which I think would be fabulous, great thing to do. And the atmospheric pressure is only 1% uh, uh, on the surface, and it's 1% of the Earth's sea level pressure, so it's got a very thin, tenuous uh, atmosphere. Very cold temperatures are between minus 140 and 20, positive 20 Celsius. Another problem that's not mentioned here is there's no magnetic field to speak of on Mars. The Earth has a pretty powerful magnetic field. It's generated by the molten lava underneath the surface uh, that keeps rotating, that generates this magnetic field. That deflects a lot of the solar wind away, and that, that doesn't impact the, uh, the Earth itself. On Mars, we don't have that, so we're going to be much more susceptible to uh, solar wind, solar cosmic radiation, cosmic rays. We also have the thinner atmosphere that isn't going to be able to protect us very much from ultraviolet light. We don't have an ozone layer like we have here on Earth, which are very important to sustain, to sustain life. Places to see, there's a whole variety of different places to go to and look at. Uh, I just show a couple of pictures there. Now, the ice caps in this photograph are shown to have ice down there, uh, but it's not water ice. It's carbon dioxide ice. It's like dry ice here. So you can't really break it up and use it as rocket fuel. We don't have any hydrogen. Uh, we could break it up and use the oxygen for supporting uh, breathing and whatnot, uh, but it doesn't work that well as a, uh, as a fuel depot for, uh, for rocket fuels. In the future missions, where do we want to go next? Going to Mars, we could go to Mars in orbit. I talked about having additional spacecraft, additional habitats to go with, not just the Orion spacecraft. There's some pictures of them uh, in the upper left-hand image. We could also go to Mars's moons. Mars has two moons, Themis and Demis. We could go visit them, uh, learn about them. Are they captured asteroids? Do they come up from the surface? What's their history? Uh, but ultimately, we want to have what we call boots on the ground. We want to have humans explore the planet themselves. We want to have that experience of an astronaut walking on another planet, not Earth, walking on Mars. And someday, that astronaut will be able to see a view which has been recorded here in the lower right. That's a Martian sunset captured by one of the, uh, one of the, one of the um, rovers that are on the planet. This is a good application for Mars, for big data, and for artificial intelligence. It's a new landing system that we're using, where the uh, spacecraft will be coming down, looking at its intended landing site. And unfortunately, when we're still up in orbit, we can't get really good detailed pictures yet of what the surface looks like. And so we have to wait till we get closer to the surface before we could take all these pictures. We have to accumulate them very, very quickly. That's where the big data concepts come in. And then we have to analyze those pictures and decide, do we need to divert to another landing location? That's where the artificial intelligence comes in and decides, well, this is going to be OK. We could land there. If not, then we have to divert to go to some other location. On the Apollo uh, 11 landing, Neil Armstrong took over manual control of the spacecraft. The spacecraft was being directed to its landing site, but it was a big rocky boulder field. He literally had to fly the lunar excursion model down a half a mile or so to find a smoother place to be able to land it. He did that in real time with a person in the loop to actually execute it. We're trying to do something very similar using big data concepts and artificial intelligence to be able to have that capability in an unmanned system so we could land rovers more accurately and more safely. A lot of times the interesting places we want to go to are not necessarily the safest places we want to land. They could be next to a canyon or by a big crater or something. We want to be near there, but we want to be careful of that danger. Using these techniques of big data and artificial intelligence hopefully gives us the capability to find the right spot, to find a safe spot, and bring our vehicle down. And so basically, we're all explorers. I started talking about that. We're all using our life experiences. We're all working together 
to expand human exploration. So keep doing that. This is a great uh, opportunity for networking and collaboration. And go forward, make those advances, keep making progress. We really need it for the humankind to advance our exploration. Finally, adelante. Gracias. Great, Joe. Thank Congratulations. you. Thank you. Now it's the moment for question. Now is the moment that you have a question, you have some doubt, you have something to ask, and he will answer to you. If you don't want to make it now, and you want to make it outside, from, I think it's... Uh, 315. 315, that's it. It's, he will answer the question outside, but you can answer now. I have some question. If no one asks, I'm going to make some. Oh, please, somebody come up with a question. <laughs> That's one guy. Uh, wait, wait until the microphone, because the, the, the one Sorry. at the last. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. What do you think will fly first, SpaceX BFR or the um, space launch system of NASA? Uh, very good question. Uh, I don't have much intelligence on the BFR. Um, I suspect it's probably going to be a year or so after SLS. Uh, but they're going to be both very, very close together. Uh, the BFR is the big, huge rocket that Elon Musk's SpaceX company is working on, which will have a tremendous payload launch capability. So we're looking forward to that, too, because anything that can bring payload up to orbit cheaply and reliably is a benefit for human exploration. Okay? No more questions? I can't see anybody, so... It's going to be me. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. One question. You said that it's really, really, really important to go to the moon. Mm -hmm. In the moment that it's happened, this was a race between Russia and America. It was so important because America need to be in that moment. But why now so important? Well, I think it's really leading to the human species to leave the planet. You know, we don't want to be stuck on one planet forever. Uh, eventually, I'm afraid that some asteroid's going to come and, and hit the planet and wipe us out. And so to ensure that our species survives in the long term, we need to move off of our planet into other planets, other parts of the solar system, other solar systems. Ultimately, I'd like to see terraforma, terraforming of the uh, Martian surface, and so we could actually go and have colonies there. And that way, that gives us that insurance that if something comes and happens to one of the planets, it doesn't extinguish the human species. Great. Also, because we need to have a dream or to, to need to go to a place, or it doesn't matter that? Well, I think that's important, too. You know, uh, humans always need to be struggling and making progress and going places. And mm -hmm. I think having a goal and getting the country and the world together towards that goal is a great thing to do. You know, it's, well, a, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a big advancement for everyone. To have a goal is really important. L last question. I, um, so you're talking about getting boots on Mars. Um, when do you expect that to happen? Will we still be alive? Well, it depends upon how old you are. Uh, <laughs> um, I hope to be alive, definitely. I think it'll probably happen around the 2050 time frame, something like that. It depends upon who does it. You know, uh, Elon Musk wants to go kind of on a one-way mission, which I don't think is necessarily the best way to do it. Uh, but, you know, who knows? He may, he may find somebody or some volunteers to, uh, to go on that one-way ride. Um, NASA's going to be a little bit more diligent about it. They're going to take their time. They're going to make sure they have all the systems working. So I would expect, eh, best guess would be 2050. Hopefully, maybe not that long, you know. It'd be nice to be, be 2030 or 2040. But uh, honestly, I think it's probably going to be more towards 2050. So do you plan on being alive in 2050? You know, I'm... I, I, I hope so, yeah. I hope so, too. I'll be old, but no, I, I should still be here. Yeah. <laughs> no more question? Yeah, someone say, yeah, but we cannot see you. Can you put your hand up or something like that? Or can we have more light for you? Not, not probably, but the microphone, the microphone is going for you. They are going. You have to continue talking like a bat, so we can hear you. With the sound, the microphone, it's going there, arriving, we cannot see, but we are trying to say what is happening. Yeah, uh, we hope, Great. okay, so my question Great. is about 
uh, the Orion mission. So uh, you were speaking about what the Orion mission is going to, uh, how the rocket was made and so, but uh, what is the Orion mission purpose, what they are trying to achieve? Well, the Orion spacecraft is designed for deep space missions. So there's a variety of different things that we could do with it. What differentiates Orion from uh, something like the SpaceX Dragon, for instance, is that we've got that high temperature heat shield that gives us the capability to go out to asteroids or the moon or with upgrades to Mars and come back in and re-enter the atmosphere. There's a variety of different things we could do with that, with that uh, capability. The Dragon spacecraft in, compa uh, in compress in comparison, uh, is unable to handle the heating from those high velocity reentries. And so it's that generic capability is the purpose of Orion. The goal now is to go to the moon, explore the moon, use the Orion to come back from the moon, and it'll be able to tolerate those high lunar reentry velocities. Thank you. Can I make a second question? Sure. Uh, it's about terraforming. It sounds very exciting. So is there any plans or is any tests made already about terraforming? Uh, there's been a few laboratory experiments. Uh, the problem is it takes a lot of chemicals that aren't found there on Mars uh, indigenously. So it, it would mean bringing a lot of stuff with us. Uh, the, the processes are pretty straightforward and are understood. Now, NASA isn't working on planning it at the moment. Uh, that's going to be pretty far down the line. You know, let's, let's get some boots on the ground first, and then we'll worry about terraforming it. And even the, the process is going to take, you know, it could take a century or so to really to get the atmosphere to transform into something that's sustainable. In other words, it's not just going to blow away in the wind and be livable or breathable to some extent. Thank you. Very interesting. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. It's been a real honor to be with real you. Real pleasure. Thank you. Thank